Hello everyone, it's me, Matthew, and welcome to What Happened, All You Brink Fans! Yeah, it's your time to shine! It's finally time to hoist this kinda well-known FPS on our stage of shame, where we'll be uncovering the dramatic shifts in development that befell this multiplayer single-player hybrid, the engine problems the studio faced, and the unforeseen acts of God or Bethesda that destroyed any chance of the game reaching its full potential. Oh, wait, none of those things really happened. Yeah, the tale of Brink doesn't have nearly the dramatics, sudden swerves, or awful decisions as a lot of games we've covered in the past, but whose only real sin was having sky-high expectations and an insurmountable amount of hype that couldn't possibly be delivered upon. So we'll need to travel back to our favorite time period in the video game industry, the one with the most studio closures, dramatically raised budgets, and razor-thin profit margins. This is 2007, and the HD era of gaming was kicking off, or kicking down, whatever. Splash Damage is a London-based developer that have a particular set of skills, and that was making multiplayer suites for already existing projects. We're talking Return to Castle Wolfenstein, then Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, and finally Doom 3. So yeah, they were obviously id software stands, something they didn't try to hide very much at all. Now, the thing about all these multiplayer modes is that they were all fantastic and basically kicked off the then newish practice of farming out your multiplayer mode to another developer, freeing up the original studio to focus on the campaign, an example being Grey Matter for Return to Castle Wolfenstein. But it was with 2007's Enemy Territory, Quake Wars, Flash Damage's first standalone release, where they really started to turn heads, despite the Quake franchise's wavering popularity with Quake 4. Quake Wars garnered fantastic reviews and even some awards, which was the poke in the bum for Bethesda to tap them for their first wholly original big budget game. In fact, in 2008, both companies announced what was quoted as being a long-term partnership, with Brink being formally unveiled 12 months later. Pete Hines, the shredder to Todd Howard's Krang, was interviewed in the Bethesda Technodrome about how this deal came about. You can look at what Splash Damage is doing and say, by God, I think they can pull it off. We should be talking to them and working with them on this, and we we are. If I didn't already write the script and know what was coming up, here is where I'd say, I hope everything goes okay. In the formal announcement, Brink was pegged as a spring 2010 release, with Bethesda fast becoming one of the biggest new third-party publishers with your Fallouts and your Elder Scrolls's. Combined with Splash Damage's pedigree, it was already being positioned as the next big FPS. It focused on the conflict between two warring factions, and a third more mysterious one that was never really expanded upon, with its mandate being to blur the line between online and offline play, which at this point would call it Duty and its many, many, many imitators flooding the multiplayer space was shooting for something different that people would hopefully take notice of. Along with all this building hype, Splash Damage also made an important hire, one Richard Ham that some people might remember from our award-winning Bubsy 3D episode. I'm still proud of Bubsy 3D. At the time, the young kids in their 20s writing reviews for magazines didn't have any idea what it took to make games. To them, their responses were just to us, it was bullshit, and Bubsy deserved better. Today, things are even more cutthroat, so personally, I'm out. I'm done with that shit. So yeah, that quote was given after Richard Hamm's creative director duties on Brink were done. And yes, he was a lead on Bubsy 3D, but he filled a similar role in the Siphon Filter games, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, and just prior to Brink, had a prominent role on Fable 2. So, you know, there's that. His curmudgeoniness was probably due to some of the lukewarm reviews that Brink posted at launch, which were probably made more potent by not one, but several delays the game suffered. The first being from that initial spring of 2010 to the following autumn. That's a product that we believe is a genre breaker. It's a real killer app. From a quality perspective, we're pitching that along the same lines as Fallout 3, which is how Bethesda's European marketing director decided to frame it. Are they insane? 
Okay. Now, while he clearly just says quality, Brink is a very, very different beast from Fallout 3. Even if you're just trying to compare their theoretical metacritics, as Bethesda likes to do. So, up to that point, the house that Todd built were almost exclusively putting out big story-driven games, which gave the impression to some that Brink would follow suit. Also, hey, hey, marketing directors, please don't use the terms killer app unless you're uh, Tron, and certainly don't fucking say shite like genre breaker. Anyway, later that same balmy summer of 2010, word came down that the game would then slip to 2011 with no real reasoning coming from either Bethesda or Splash Damage, other than just simply confirming it. This would now place Brink 12 months after its initial target release date, further increasing the anticipation, which would surely be worth the wait. Now, because of the tone I just used in that sentence, yeah, that wasn't exactly true. Brink had several issues at launch, which isn't a surprise given all the new things it was attempting, but nonetheless, reviewers noticed them. Paul Wedgwood, Splash Damage's former CEO and founder, humbly explains where he believes they faltered. It was our first console game. There are a lot of things to take on. We ported id Tech 4 to PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, which it didn't exist on at all, with some help from id, of course. So we just bit off too much, really. We didn't test it thoroughly enough before the release, and there were three fundamental problems. It had some issues with lag on day one of the release. Then there were texture load-in problems, and finally, some AI problems as well. They were all sitting there in a day one patch, but we just couldn't get people to re-review it after the initial release. If we could delete those first seven or eight reviews, we'd be at 90 or something, but it was too late, so lesson learned. Yes, upon release, Brink did get some fairly average reviews from well-known publications, citing the problems above. What's more is that the game, from a narrative, character, and storyline perspective, was not exactly what some fans wanted, especially when coming from Bethesda. It didn't really put the characters front and center like, you know, Bethesda as Rogue Warrior did. What took you motherfuckers so long? It also didn't really push the story into the spotlight, but focused on the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay with narrative crumbs sprinkled throughout via dialogue rather than a glut of cutscenes. Nowadays, people are more accustomed to that style with things like, say, Destiny or Overwatch, but in 2011, it was jarring and made the game feel a bit lighter with some feeling that it had a smaller scope because of it. Lead designer on Brink, Neil Alfonso, also gave his two cents on the game's reaction and legacy. People react reacted differently to the way we approached our narrative. Some would say there's no story to speak of, which I would beg to differ with, but some loved the setting and the context we'd given the action. There's a lot there for people to read into, but we didn't spoon feed it to people, which is maybe what some fans were looking for. When the game is viewed as a highly contextualized multiplayer experience, it does really well, but if you view it as a single player cinematic experience, yeah, it doesn't really hold up. One of the other aspects that didn't really hold up was Brink's reliance on in-game dialogue to drive the narrative, which is a problem considering the many, many lines that got repeated too often. Now, when you're playing an isolated multiplayer mode in a game with a separate campaign, you might hear the same few lines of dialogue here and there. Things like, I need help, man down, flank him, and etc. But in Brink, well, you'd hear those the entire game. Brink's lead writer, Ed Stern, explains. Do not leave writing to the actors. Write out all the alternate lines no matter how stupid you feel. I felt really dumb writing a script that said, Medic! Medic! Need a medic here! Need a medic? Really do need a medic? Medic here now I need. I just really felt stupid doing that. So I thought we'd write some basic ones down and then get the actors to do their own variations. That was an absolute mistake. Stern also revealed that when they needed to start inserting said lines into the game, splash damage were scrambling to finish, and there weren't enough coders and testers to make sure all that repetitive dialogue wasn't too repetitive. In the end, though, he laments that the issue came down to him ultimately. That's my fault. That's nothing on the coding. I should have written more varied lines. The core game itself was a whole different story. While some felt it was exciting and a breath of fresh air, Brink's gameplay loop could have used more polish and focused testing about what worked and what needed more work. 
Paul Wedgwood again breaks it down. Brink tried to be something new and different in several areas, and in hindsight, we perhaps strayed away from convention a bit too much in some areas. Now, since you were always teamed with AI bots in single player, when objectives would dynamically appear, the bots would make their own decisions, as the player could not control them, directly or indirectly. This was necessary to get the bots to use the levels properly. Adjusting them dynamically created a rhythm that matched the multiplayer in a single player game, but it kind of makes the AI seem stupid sometimes, because they won't just go for the objective as much as they can at the very beginning. The way the game worked, it sometimes meant the player could play poorly and win, like literally at some points they could sit in the spawn area and their team would go on and win, or you could kick absolute ass and still lose. The thing is, even with all these problems, Brink really didn't capture gamers' imaginations through the characters or the narrative, something most hero-based products do nowadays. Conversely, there was never much to do in the game once you hit the level cap, and there was only one significant DLC pack ever released, Agents of Change, but it released the same year as launch. Now, despite this drying up of support, with many players dropping Brink within months or even weeks, it was still a success for Bethesda and Splash damage, even if it wasn't enough to spur a sequel. Paul Wedgworth commented on this. I was walking out on stage and signing autographs for thousands of people at a time. It was a crazy time, the weirdest, weirdest experience. But it's bullshit. It's not you that's made the game, it's the team that's made the game. And it's the team that's responsible for the success of it. And Brink was a commercial success. It sold 2.5 million units, it generated over $100 million at retail, and it was our fifth sequential number one, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't a critical success. We really missed the mark with the initial release, and that frustrated us a lot. Therefore, after Brink, Splash Damage immediately went back to providing multiplayer modes for other titles, such as Batman Arkham Origins, which I didn't even know had a multiplayer mode until I just said it. They then followed up with Dirty Bomb, another multiplayer-focused FPS, which was initially published by Nexon in 2015, but much like Brink, it failed to make any sort of impact, with a 2019 player base about where you'd expect it. Nexon eventually threw the Dirty Bomb rights back at Splash Damage, but not before they were then wholly purchased by Lei Yu, the same Chinese company that owns Digital Extremes in 2016. Along the way, Splash has contributed to the multiplayer modes of both Gears 4 and 5, and are currently plugging away at Gears Tactics, which I also just remembered is a product you may or may not be able to buy at some point in the future. Going back, one final time to Brink, almost seven years after its release, Bethesda announced it was going free to play? <laughs> this is like finding out that, I don't know, Gladiator Sword of Vengeance got an HD remaster on Steam. Which it did. So, yes, Bethesda announcing, for some reason, that a seven-year-old game that has no microtransactions is now free, so they can't even make money on it. Who are you and what have you done to Bethesda? I mean, the original DLC pack still costs some money, yeah, but this is just... It, it, it's something. It, it occurred, I guess. In summation, much like games that we've covered before, such as Kingdoms of Amalur or L.A. Noir, there was no real fan backlash to Brink. It didn't receive terrible reviews, it sold well, and outside some aspects that needed more polish and maybe trying things that were a bit too ahead of their time, the game had no real debilitating problems or scandals. And like stated before, Splash Damage is still alive and well, which... It's a nice change of pace for this show, because it's really rare that a developer that worked with Bethesda was able to pull themselves back from the brink of closure. If you want to throw another stinky suggestion into our squared circle, let me know in the comments below or parkour your way to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially vote on our next subject. See you next time, and thanks for watching!